Hello and welcome to a history teacher ranks pharaohs. Today we are going to rank nine pharaohs from ancient Egypt from S tier to F tier. So let's get into the nine pharaohs we're going to be ranking. The first one is Oh my god. How's that? Are we good? We good? Are we are we still green screen in here? Okay. No problem. Not not technical difficulties. All right, the first one is Ramses the 2nd, also known as Ramses the Great. So, bonus points right off the bat. If your name is Ramses the Great or if you have the great in your title, uh, you're already winning. So let's see. Ramses the Great uh, ruled from 1279 to 1213 BCE. He ruled 67 years. I got my notes here. 67 years. He had a big ego, so he's known as the big ego pharaoh. Uh, he made statues of himself and his face everywhere. So if you see a statue of a pharaoh in a history book or in a picture, it's probably Ramses the Great. He made the Abu Simbel statues at uh, yeah in uh, outside of Aswan, and they are 67 feet tall. There's four of them, 67 feet. What is that in meters? Okay, 20 and a half meters tall. So that means he had to uh, commission them. He had to decide to carve out of this mountain. He had to get the sculptors to climb down, probably hanging from ropes to, to chisel out the mountain, um, the designers to kind of sculpt the shape they wanted. And... Um, yeah, then the painters to come in, paint it. So Abu Simbel, what a remarkable place. If you haven't been, go. It's awesome. And then the inside of the temple, completely done with statues of himself as well. So loved statues of himself, loved his own face. You what? The other thing about Abu Simbel is that um, it's in an area where people didn't really go. And it's probably there for propaganda. It's probably there to kind of keep the Kush from creeping up the Nile, or I should say down the Nile, up, up Egypt. But yeah, just there uh, to put your face on. So that's a Ramses the Great. What else is he known for? He died around 90 to 91 years old. That's pretty good for 3,000 years ago, over 3,000 years ago. What else? He had over 100 kids, 52 sons to be exact. How do you pick, how do you pick an heir? 52 sons. Uh, that's kind of just like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, you. Also, how do you remember all their names? Um, 52. Maybe you just keep calling them the same name, like uh, George Foreman. Everybody's just going to be Ramses the Great Jr. Ramses the Great Jr. Ramses the Great Jr. Ramses the Great Jr. And uh, easy to remember. Okay. Uh, what else? He is known as the military pharaoh. So he was a great conqueror. He won battles. There's this uh, famous... Artwork here of himself against the Hittites. And he went into battle with a lion. Big plus, big plus. You go into battle with a lion, huge plus. If that doesn't say scary, I don't know what does. All right. Uh, and before, let's go take a look. What does his mummy look like? Let's look. Okay. So, you know, he, he looks okay. These days, you know. Um, and then let's look at his. Let's look at his modern day picture. 
Okay, so that's what he was supposed to look like nowadays based on his mummy. Eh, not bad looking, not bad. So, you know, no points taken away there. So, Ramses the Great ruled 67 years, longest of any pharaoh. 67 years. Died in his 90s. Big ego. Lots of statues. Uh, went into battle. Led the warriors from the front. Went to battle with a lion on a chariot. Had over 100 kids. Uh, I got to put Ramses in to S tier. Ramses the Great is an S tier pharaoh. So, whoop, over here. And you're going that way. All right, go to S tier. All right, the next pharaoh we're going to rank is Cleopatra. Cleopatra might be one of the most famous people out of Egypt ever. Um, I think, I feel like everyone has just heard of Cleopatra. And her story alone could make a soap opera. It could go on and on and on. Uh, so she has quite the story, so let's get into it. <laughs> so Cleopatra is the last pharaoh of Egypt, and here's how that went down. This is during a time when the Ptolemies or the Greeks had taken control of Egypt. Alexander the Great came in, he took over Egypt, he died, his kingdom got split into three parts, I believe, and the Ptolemies took Egypt. And, you know, generation after generation, the Greeks don't care about the Egyptians. They control Egypt, but they don't really care about Egyptian culture. When she comes to power, she wants to change that. She is the only Ptolemy that learns how to speak Egyptian. She tries to bring back the Egyptian religion. Um, and overall, she's just a genuinely smart girl. She's a very smart person, and she really appreciates and respects the culture and history of Egypt and wants to bring it back. So what happens? What goes wrong? Well, um, there's a bit of a civil war going on with her brother, and Egypt is unstable. Egypt becomes unstable with its government, and this raises the eyebrows of Rome. Eyebrows raised. Rome is concerned because Egypt is the breadbasket of Rome. Egypt has excess grain. It always has because of the Nile. Egypt fed Rome. Egypt feeds Rome's troops. And it's kind of a catch-22 because... Egypt is kind of making Rome more powerful by being able to feed its army and keep that army going. And so as Rome has a huge army, Egypt does not. And Rome does not want anything to happen to this grain, doesn't want to have anything to this food. Rome wants this food to continue to supply its troops. So when there's turmoil in Egypt, Rome comes in. Rome says, okay, we're, we're coming in. Cleopatra flees. She has to flee the palace. Caesar comes in. He pretty much takes control. And I know we all know of Julius Caesar. He's in Egypt. He's in Alexander. He, he takes control. Alexandria, which is named after Alexander the Great. And Cleopatra, she's only 17 at this time. She goes and raises an army. She's not done. And she comes back. But she wants to confront Caesar. So she sneaks herself into the palace. She has herself rolled up in a carpet. And the carpet is presented as a gift to Caesar. And when he unrolls it, there she is. Okay, so surprise! <laughs> Here's a 17-year-old girl. Here's Cleopatra. So what does he do? Well, he's impressed. Rome right now is still kind of a brand new country. 
Rome is still kind of in its is in its own stone age. It's not the Rome you see today. It's not the it's not the Pantheon, it's not the Colosseum. It's it's not that yet. Still beginning. And he's impressed by this woman who one is intelligent, two speaks five to six languages. It has the audacity to confront him as the leader, as the pharaoh. That doesn't happen in Rome. You know, at this time, Roman women are somewhat uneducated. They're in the home. So he's impressed. He's like, whoa. And so she charms him, and she takes him on a tour through Egypt. She takes him up the Nile. They go to Giza. They look at the pyramids Neferu built. Uh, they go all the way to Aswan, where obelisks are made. And by that time, she's pregnant with his kid. So she's really impressed him. And he'll take her back to Rome. He kind of supports her being the pharaoh of Egypt. Um, the Roman troops support her leadership. She and, and Caesar are kind of allied. This is okay. This is working out. I am the very model of an ancient Roman emperor. I... And Caesar is impressed with Egypt. Yay! He's never seen anything like pyramids. He's never seen anything like mummies. This idea of uh, resurrection and having another life, they're all new to him, and he's impressed. So, what happens in Rome? T-Togas, show the folks back home you've been to Rome by wearing a T-Toga. Well, this is when things kind of take a turn to the worse. Um, Cleopatra arrives in Rome with uh, Caesar's son, which is Caesarian, little Caesar, <laughs> pizza, pizza. And Caesar is there, and this starts to now raise more eyebrows. So more eyebrows raised by the Senate. Caesar is now really grasping firm control, a dictatorship. And he has now the backing of Egypt, one of the most respected civilizations in the ancient world. So this raises the eyebrows of the Senate. They're going, hmm, okay, this guy's really powerful. He now has an heir. He now has an ally in a powerful country. He has the influence of the army. He can feed that army with Egypt's grain. We need to get rid of him. And this is where the Ides of March come in. So the beware the Ides of March. So um, Cleopatra's in Rome. Caesar goes to the Senate on the Ides of March, or March 15th. And that is when he's assassinated. He's killed. And I know you know this, because we talked about this in class. Beware the Ides of March. So this is when Caesar gets that prophecy that he, he, shouldn't, uh, he shouldn't go to the Senate on March 15th. And he does, and he gets assassinated. Aww. So now Cleopatra's in trouble. She's in Rome. She's in kind of enemy territory. She is now widowed. She has a son. And she's got to get out of there. So she heads back to Egypt. And... You know, she's doing okay. And when she was in Rome, before she had fled, she met a general called Mark Antony. And she threw some of these lavish parties. Um, probably most lavish parties, some of the most lavish parties in all of history. She would give away things. You know, you'd show up and she would say, oh, you like that? Take it. You know, take the dinnerware with you. Take the chairs. Take the furniture. Um, you know, you left her parties with some really good parting gifts. You know, so, and that impressed Mark Antony. He was a, a general in Rome, and he would he would court Cleopatra, and she would become pregnant with his kids, twins, in fact. Um, and when she has one of them, or she, when she has both of them, she names them um, 
Alexander. So she tries to rename one of them after Alexander the Great. So going back to the roots of the Greek takeover in Egypt. So the first one, Alexander the Great. And she names her second one, Cleopatra the Moon. But then Mark Antony kind of abandons her as well. He goes off. He gets married, and so now she has three kids. She's in Egypt, three kids, no husband, and, you know, I'm sure she's a bit miffed by that. So a few, a few years later, Rome is still in turmoil. The, the vacuum power left by Caesar's assassination is still there, and there are still people vowing, vying to take power. So we have Mark Antony who's one of the lead runners to take power. And then we have Octavian. Octavian Augustus also wanted to take power. And you might also hear his name called Octavian. So Octavian, Mark Antony. And Mark Antony, realizing what Caesar had done, reaches out to Cleopatra. You know, he realizes Egypt is an important ally. And one he wants to have. So he reaches out to her and he says, you know, I need your help. Um, and Cleopatra gives him help. They end up going a uh, civil war with Octavian. And the major battle is fought at sea. And she's out there. She's on her own boat. She's with Mark Antony. They're fighting against Octavian and they lose. So uh, this is... Oh, boy. This is when um, they flee back to Egypt. They're in the palace. And this is kind of a... I wonder if Shakespeare gets his influence for Romeo and Juliet about what happens next. But Cleopatra writes Octavian a, a note. And it says, By the time you get this, I've already killed myself. Aww. And when Octavian gets the note... Or sorry, when uh, Augustus... When Mark Antony gets the note, he kills himself. He takes his sword, he runs himself through. Aww. But the thing is, Cleopatra did not actually kill herself by then. When she hears about that, she has his body brought to him. And, you know, she watches him die. And, she, you know, surprise, I didn't actually kill myself. So she actually gets captured. Octavian shows up in Egypt. He captures her. And his plan is to parade her through the streets of Rome, uh, you know, show her off as a spoil of war, as a prize. And she doesn't want to do that. She, you know, she's above that. She's nobody's prize. So she famously has a cobra snuck into her uh, with some food delivery. Waitress! While she's in prison. And she has the cobra bite her. And she dies. So Mark An or, uh, Octavian takes control of Egypt. Octavian takes control of Rome. And he becomes the next emperor. So, and, that, and that's the end of Egypt. That's the end of the pharaohs. That's the end of the Greek rule. Egypt now becomes a province of Rome. So where do we rank... Cleopatra. And my very brief story here does not do her tale justice, but we'll try. So one, very smart, very intelligent, wants to bring back the Egyptian culture and religion. She's the only Ptolemy to speak Egyptian. Cool. She speaks five to six languages. Cool. Um, even at such a young age, her audacity to approach Caesar, to sneak herself into a palace in a rug. Um, when she does back up Mark Antony, she goes out on her own warship, so she's in battle. She's not a coward. She was a woman of entrances, too, when she arrives in Rome with Caesar. What an entrance. What an entrance. So... A woman of entrance.
woman with power, a woman with some of the best parties you could ever go to, uh, a woman that's a widow, twice, and still, you know, carries on. So, let's see. How would I rank her? I think, I think Cleopatra is, is clearly an A. Clearly an A. If she was able to have a better, better circumstance where, um, you know, Egypt is not in turmoil, Egypt's not threatened by Rome, if, you know, Caesar wasn't assassinated, I think that'd be clearly S tier. But unfortunately, her, her power and her reign is a bit short. But all the things she did and her intelligence and her accomplishments and her confidence, definite A tier. So let's, whoop, let's move Cleopatra to A. Okay, the next pharaoh is Narmer. Now, Narmer is famous for being the first pharaoh. He becomes pharaoh in about 3100 BCE, so over 5,000 years ago, long time ago. All right, so what do we know about Narmer? Really, this should be a tribute to, what do I know about the Narmer palette? <laughs> so let's talk about the Narmer palette. The Narmer palette is just that. It's a palette that is the first historical document in all of history. The first. So think about that. The first historical document in all of history. And by palette, it's, it's not like an artist palette. It's for makeup. So the Egyptians loved makeup, um, always wore makeup, loved colors, and on the palette they would crush up um, stone or whatever and mix it with animal fat and turn it into makeup. So this particular palette in terms of a makeup palette is pretty big. It's pretty big. In terms of a historical document, it feels kind of small. But as a makeup palette, it's huge. It's not something you would you would probably use. It was probably ceremonial, used for uh, maybe a god, a statue in the Holy of Holies, uh, maybe for a pharaoh. But it wasn't like a regular everyday item. It's it's pretty big. And so what do we know about the Narmer palette? Well, here's what we know about Narmer. And it's all on his palette on the first historical document in the world. And this is what we know. So we know his name is Narmer because the palette has the first hieroglyphs on it. The first hieroglyphs recorded. And at the very top of the palette, you'll see a fish and a chisel. So a fish is Nar. A chisel is mer, and we get narmer. Um, the hieroglyphs are, I don't know, I would say they're generally phonetic, but not always. They could actually represent the picture they are as well. And in this case, they are phonetic, so it's, it's, his name is not fish chisel, his name is narmer. And so on the front of the palette, we have narmer. And he's standing there with a mace. He's got a, essentially a stone club. And he's holding another person by the hair. And he's essentially about to hit him in the head. Boom. So he's, maybe this is the pharaoh of lower Egypt that he's conquering here. I don't know. But he's, you know, smiting. He's taking down this. And this will become the, the pharaoh pose for the next 3,000 years. This will be the symbol of power. So this is the first time we see it. Narmer's doing it. And Narmer's wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. The white crown of Lower Egypt. 
And so we think Narmer came from Lower Egypt, he conquers Upper Egypt, and he makes one Egypt. He's making a unified Egypt, in which a pharaoh would rule from here on out for the next 3,000 years. And also on the front of this um, palette, we have a bird grabbing a guy by the nose. This will be Horus. Uh, literally yanking someone by their nose, dragging someone from their nose. And on the back, so we want to flip the palette over, it's two-sided. On the back, we'll have his name again, we'll have Narmer. Then we'll have a parade. And Narmer is in this parade, he's the biggest figure, he's the most important part. And in front of the parade is a bunch of headless bodies. <laughs> So they don't have any heads left. And this is kind of showing what happens if you try to fight against Narmer. Narmer still has his mace stick with him. And he's marching in this parade with the crown of Lower Egypt. He's got the red crown of Lower Egypt. I've always wondered what that, that curly cue that comes out of that crown is. I have no idea. I always wondered it. I want to see it. <laughs> but... It's interesting, but that's the crown of Lower Egypt, and he's wearing it. So he's signifying on the back that he's also the pharaoh of Lower Egypt. And his fish chisel, his Narmer name, is right next to him. And below that, below the parade, are two lions or leopards, uh, large cat creatures with super long necks. And they're kind of intertwining. This probably shows the combining of Upper and Lower Egypt, the two empires at the time, and they're combining together. Between that is a big hole that's somewhat indented. It's engraved. That is probably where they would mix the makeup. So you would crush your stone and fat in there, you would mix it around, and then you would apply it to probably under your eyes, to your face. So it's probably the makeup portion of the palette. And then below those two lions or leopards is a bull. A bull that is kind of crushing a person, but also collapsing a wall of a city. Wow. The bull is a second representation of a pharaoh. The first being the falcon, the animal, the Horus. The second being a bull showing power. So in this case, we can almost have the pharaoh who is absolutely crushing this person and ramming down the city, probably the capital of Lower Egypt at the time, and perhaps even the pharaoh or leader of Lower Egypt. So that is signifying power. So there's actually a lot on this palette here. There's a lot of information to be uh, told. So what else do we know about Narmer? Well, he is pharaoh of Lower Egypt, <gasps> conquers Upper Egypt. <gasps> He starts a precedence that's going to last for 3,000 years. This idea of a pharaoh ruling, a single power, um, the pose, the smiting pose, the combination of the crowns. They will later combine the white and red crown together. This idea of a single empire is because of Narmer. So Narmer unifies Egypt. And that's pretty important. And he starts a tradition that's going to last for the next 3,000 years. So let's see here. How do you rank Narmer? Well, or should I say, how do you rank the Narmer palette? Because that's everything I know about Narmer is off this palette. And... I mean... So, aside from the palette, we kind of have limited knowledge of him. But also, you know, he unified Egypt. That's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. So, unified Egypt has the first historical document in all of history. You know, the smiting pose that every pharaoh would uh, adopt after this, this pose of power. I've got to put Narmer in... Tier B, a solid B. If I knew a bit more about him, 
if there was more records of what he did, uh, family life, social life, easy A. But the only thing I really know is that he unified Egypt uh, in a big war of some kind. So the unifier Egypt, he'll create a tradition that will last for the next 3,000 years. Based on that, solid B. All right, the next pharaoh is Narmer. So we're going a bit past. The next pharaoh is Sneferu. We're going a bit past Narmer, and we're going to the pharaoh that does pyramids. And you probably haven't heard about Sneferu, but you should. So let's talk about pyramids in Egypt. When you think Egypt, you think pyramids. And you're probably thinking of the three pyramids at Giza. But there's more. Tons more. There's over 100 pyramids in Egypt. And there's at least five big ones in Egypt. You always see those three because they're together in Giza. But not too far away, there's more. So we'll talk about Sneferu. One, he has a cool name, Sneferu. Uh, parents, you know, you having a kid soon? Sneferu, probably an underrated name. Go for it. So, Sneferu. How does he teach us about pyramids? How does he start this? Well, we got to start with the step pyramid. So... During, after Narmer, the Egyptians are burying in the sand, and the sand erodes, it blows away. Bodies come up, jackals come out, eat the bodies. It's probably why Anubis is the jackal-headed god of mummification. And you don't want that, so they start burying bodies into tombs, into the bedrock. Clear the sand bury into the bedrock, and then you got to cap it. You put a lid on it with a mastaba, or a bench. And these big stones stop the erosion. They prevent anyone from getting into the tomb. And, you know, burying a body into the bedrock stops it from coming up through the sand and being jackal food. So, Zosser gets this idea, well, I guess technically his architect, Imhotep, gets this idea of putting a mastaba on top of a mastaba, on top of a mastaba, and on and on and on, kind of like you're layering a cake, and you get the step pyramid. And Sneferu sees this step pyramid, and he wants a pyramid when he's pharaoh. And he starts with this pyramid at Maidu. And it's almost like a tower. It's, it's a really high step pyramid. But something goes wrong. It's, it's not quite working out. It's kind of collapsing in. And so they abandon this. They abandon this project. And Sneferu is not one to be deterred. He tries again. And so they built the Bent Pyramid. In Arabic, it's known as the Dead Pyramid. And they built this Bent Pyramid. But the problem with this Bent Pyramid is that it's not built on bedrock. It's not quite all the way down to the bottom. And so the sides begin to slip. And it kind of implodes upon itself. The weight of the blocks are kind of pushing on the burial chamber. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll quickly finish it. They see it's, it's happening. And about three-fourths of the way up, they change the angle to finish it quicker. And that is why it's called the Bent Pyramid, because the angle has been changed to quickly finish it. And they'll actually get cedars of Lebanon to support the burial chamber. It's kind of hope holding it open from imploding in on itself. And of course, Sneferu does not want his burial 
to be in a pyramid that's going to collapse in on itself. And so then they go for the next pyramid, now called the Red Pyramid. And this becomes the first true pyramid ever built. Cool. It has smooth sides on all four sides. It is built. Um, it's bigger than uh, Menkere's pyramid. So it's the third largest pyramid in Egypt. And he buries himself in the pyramid. I think. You what? Yeah, I think he I think he's actually in the pyramid. So you to get in today, you've got to climb up about halfway. Yeah, he's inside. So you gotta climb about halfway. Then you find a chute. It's it's a really small tunnel. You can't stand in it, you you can't comfortably go down it. You gotta go down backwards. You gotta climb down backwards. And it's sixty, I think it's sixty meters down. You go straight down. And then you're inside the chamber, and then you get a good tour of the corbelled ceilings. And then you got to climb up a stairwell that has been added today. It wasn't there in ancient times. And then you get to Sneferu's burial. So he's in the pyramid. This is the first time uh, a pharaoh has been buried above ground. And he's going to set kind of an example for his son, Khufu, who will build the Great Pyramid. And... Uh, then Khafre, then Menkere, and so on, with burying yourself in a pyramid. So his burial is set inside the pyramid, and he's the first pharaoh to do that. Wow. So there's a lot of firsts. One, he builds three pyramids. Three. And pharaoh has done that. Two, he buries himself in a pyramid. He's the first one not to be buried in a tomb in the ground. And he builds the largest pyramid ever built at the time. He builds the largest room ever built at the time. Uh, when the burial chamber of the Red Pyramid was finished, that was the largest room ever. And that's kind of incredible that you're going to build this, this giant room to seal up, to be a tomb. But that's it. That's the largest pyramid. And, you know, he tries and tries again. So Sneferu is the guy, he's the pharaoh that, you know, made Giza possible, makes... Um, makes Egypt known for the pyramids. So he tries three times, gets it right in the third time. The red pyramid is still there today. Just like the pyramids of Giza, the casing blocks have been taken off, and that's how it gets its name. The stone underneath kind of glows red in the sun. Um, when Sneferu was finished with it, he had the smooth casing stones on it that Khufu and Menkere and Khafra would all copy afterwards, uh, unlike the Step Pyramid. So another thing he does right is that he gets the casing stones, he smooths it out. He wants to make a, uh, a true pyramid, all smooth sides. And he doesn't do it for any special reason. It's not like you know, a, a pyramid shape was sacred to the Egyptians. It's pretty much done for architectural reasons. He, they really wanted to see could they do it? You know, they knew that the step pyramid was possible. Now they wanted to know, what's the next step? Can we make this prettier? Can we make this better looking? Can we smooth out these sides? And the answer was yes. So Sneferu, the pyramid founder, the, the pharaoh who began what Egypt is, you know, Egypt is most famous for like mummies and pyramids. So he gets half of that credit there. He begins the pyramid craze. Um, cool name. So, you know, got to put that into account. I've got to put Sneferu. I've got to put Sneferu. You know, he's, he's one of my favorite pharaohs. So I got to put him up in S. S tier. You know, without him, we wouldn't have the pyramids in Giza. So, Sneferu, S tier. Okay, let's continue with Hatshepsut. What do we know about Hatshepsut? So her father is Tutmosis I. 
and he is the one that creates the Valley of the Kings. She marries Tutmosis II. He dies, and Tutmosis III, their child, is too young to become Pharaoh. So she kind of takes over. She rules as Pharaoh in his place. So what are some things that make Hatshepsut uh, good and famous? One is she builds an incredible temple. She builds this temple uh, called Deir al-Bari, and it is right next to the Valley of the Kings. Let's look at that temple. So this temple is unlike any other. There isn't quite anything like it, so really cool temple. What else does she do? Well, she's, she's the obelisk pharaoh. And as we've learned, obelisks weren't easy to quarry, they weren't easy to get out of Aswan, they weren't easy to erect, they weren't easy to get down the Nile. She erects four of them and they're at Karnak Temple. So she is the obelisk pharaoh. She gets four of them. And we know because in her temple at Deir al-Bari, she records a lot of interesting scenes on the walls. So she writes about trade expedi expeditions. Um, the first time we ever see uh, other lands uh, deep into Africa. So they're trading with a land called Punt which might be Eritrea. Um, below the Sudan, it's, it's down, so they've got to take the Red Sea. They've got to carry their boats, so they go down the Nile. They carry their boats across. They go to the Red Sea. They go farther down, and they trade in this land of Punt. So incredible expedition. That's on her wall of the temple, and it gives archaeologists a sense of what other cultures deep in Africa look like at that time. Uh, the houses on the temple walls, they have thatched roofs, so we can get a sense of what the homes looked like back then for the land of Punt. And they bring back things like ivory and incense. So now we're getting different kinds of trading materials being brought back in Egypt, and Hatshepsut is responsible for that. What else? Well. She gives us clues on how obelisks were erected, um, how they were transported. We get to see pictures, or I should say, we get to see artwork of the obelisk coming down the Nile and being towed by multiple boats. I think over 20 boats are towing these obelisks. And um, we get that. Toasty! We get that crucial information on her temple walls. And finally, she ruled like a pharaoh. She dressed like a pharaoh. She wore the false beard of a pharaoh. So she really takes control. She's not just temporary. She takes control all the way up until her death, and then Tutmosis III will become pharaoh. And she gets buried in the Valley of the Kings as well, and she actually uh, has her father's sarcophagus put into her tomb with hers. Not her husband's, I guess she didn't really like him, but her father's. So, can we see Hatshepsut's mummy? Alright, and can we see what does Hatshepsut look like today? Hmm, okay. Not bad, not bad. And uh, based on all these things, so she's the pharaoh the pharaoh of obelisks, and I love obelisks. Where are we going to put Hatshepsut? Um, I'm going to rank Hatshepsut in the B. We'll put her in a B category. So, didn't do much wars, didn't do much expanding or looting on behalf of Egypt, but did do expeditions, did quarry obelisks. Toasty! I think that's all positive. Great temple. If you haven't seen it, go. It's awesome.
Um, I guess one thing to add is that after the death of Hatshepsut, Tutmosis III and subsequent pharaohs were kind of a racer from history. They'll uh, wall up one of the obelisks at Karnak. They'll chisel out her cartouches, her names out of places, and she's left off of the records. There are lists of all the kings that ever uh, ruled in Egypt, and she's left off. So, bummer. Uh, probably because uh, she was a woman. Probably because the thought of change or something different uh, in ancient Egypt was difficult to live with. Uh, Egypt is very conservative. They don't change anything. So the fact that a woman was a pharaoh and it wasn't a man uh, probably upset people. Probably Tutmosis III. You know, he did wait, but then they slowly just erased her. So, bummer! Aww. Next is Akhenaten. Akhenaten is... A very interesting pharaoh. He's the one with the really funny head. And yeah, he's known as the heretic pharaoh. What's going on? So the thing about Egypt, and I just mentioned, it's a very conservative country. Things don't change. Their artwork, uh, from the beginning to the end, is the same. Their language, the hieroglyphs, the writing, the same. They're gods, the same. The statues, the representations of the gods, the same. And, and that's quite incredible. Imagine, um, you know, having the same artwork for 3,000 years on your wall in your culture. It's just unheard of. So they're very conservative. Akhenaten comes along and he really changes all that. The first thing he does is he kind of goes on this religious cult <laughs> craziness and um, he kind of throws out the religion. He, he says there's only one god, it's the Aten. The Aten is this solar disk, it's like uh, the sun. It's, you know, there's no embodiment of it. There's no statue you can really make of it. But he says, nope, this is the one. Um, so out of all gods to choose, he chooses that one, this minor god. And he says, no, Aten is the one. And he prays! Oh my God, God pray. And this obviously upset people. And he's got to move his capital. He can't be in Thebes anymore. He can't be in Memphis. And he goes out and he builds a new capital dedicated to the Aten. And uh, he takes about twenty to 30,000 people with him. They go, they will follow him, and they build this new capital, this Aten capital, to this solar disk god, and he never leaves. He stays in this capital for the rest of his life. And so that brings a few problems. One, you don't really have an effective ruler if they never leave. They're kind of just ruling over this one city. Two, he's not in charge of the army. He's not conquering other lands. He's not looting and taking things back or payments. Um, so that's a problem. What's going on? He's the world's first monotheistic person. He's creating the world's first monotheism. This problem <gasps> of this eye. Which monotheism is kind of divisive. Polytheism, generally people just thought you worship the same gods, you just had different names for them. Monotheism becomes really divisive. And that doesn't really change throughout history. So he creates this one god, this Aten, in his city, the, uh, the city of the Aten. And then he changes the artwork. So 3,000 years of tradition. You're no longer making statues to gods. So all those statue makers, out of business. Um, the the creativity, he's now encouraging creativity and differences. His statues are, are strange. They're, they're almost like male, female um, statues. There's, no, there's nothing really specific. You're kind of just looking at a, an androgynous body. It could be either. They're really weird. And the heads on them, they're no longer really realistic. They're elongated. His artwork really changes things. 
And then he has artwork of this Aten. And the colors are somewhat changing. And, you know, we're getting rays of sunlight coming out of this Aten. Things you didn't see in artwork, they're changing. So, Akhenaten, really divisive. You know, considered the heretic pharaoh. So where do we rank him? Well, I mean, you're ruining 3,000 years of, well, I guess by the time he comes by, 2,000 years of tradition here. Uh, you're changing things, you're creating monotheism, you're throwing out the gods, you're upsetting your people, you kind of get booted out of your capital, you never leave your new capital. Um... F, F tier, just strange guy, weird, statue, F, religion, F, everything about this guy, F. Now I will say, the next problem with Akhenaten is what happens after he dies. Because he was not a strong pharaoh leading the army, he creates a bit of a vacuum. Um... And his son, his son is Tuank Amen. I think we all have heard of him. His son and his daughter kind of get married and they're supposed to rule and that's supposed to be the next kingdom. And because he was so unpopular, they actually defaced his sarcophagus. This is, this is not broken to time, this is, somebody defaced it. He was just that unpopular. So his, uh, his ka and his ba could not recognize each other. His spirit could not come and find his body. They defaced the face. They defaced the face. You what? There you go. Um, so let's take a look at that. So yeah, that's how unpopular he is. Even after he has died. This changing of the traditions is that unpopular. And the power vacuum he leaves is that his son, who's supposed to, and his son quickly, either he's advised to or he does it on his own, but he quickly kind of erases everything his father did. He changes his name. His name was Tuank Aten to Tuank Amun. So he's giving praise to Amun again, no longer Aten. He's saying, nope, nope, new name, new name. Uh, we're going to give praise to Amun. And he erases everything his father did. He's kind of moving on. He's bringing back the traditions. But it makes it easy for people to kind of be okay with erasing to Ankh Amun as well. So let's then rank and talk about to Ankh Amun. Probably the most famous pharaoh to date. Because um, his tomb was found intact. So we have all these artifacts from two uncommon. We have his body, we have his sarcophagus, we have his death mask. Um, his death mask may be on your history book if you're in America. And they still have the same one. It might be, I think it was on my history book. So it might be on yours. Um, so he's one of the most famous pharaohs. The thing is, he didn't do much. Uh, didn't do much, didn't reign long. He was really young when Akhenaten died. And he probably had advisors, he probably had a vizier um, named I helping him out, maybe helping him make these decisions to change his name, and giving praise back to the original gods, kind of erasing the memory of his father. And there's a great theory out there by Bob Breer, famous Egyptologist, Bob Breer. If you don't know him, go check him out. He's awesome. And his theory is that Tuankhamen was murdered. Oh my god, he's dead? No! And the evidence he proposes is this. We know that Tuankhamen, about 18 years old, just kind of disappears. Egyptians didn't record deaths. They didn't really record bad things in general, so... <laughs> um, once he, someone disappears and no longer written about, they're probably dead. So he disappears around 18. 
his sister slash wife, who was, you know, they were supposed to be the next rulers of Egypt. She sends this famous letter, I believe it was to the Hittites, uh, a nearby kingdom. She sends this famous letter that says, I'm scared. Send me a prince to marry. So we know that Tuankhamun's gone if she wants to remarry. Um, Tuankhamun's gone. She wants to marry a enemy. The Hittites weren't allies of Egypt. They were enemies. So this is really weird. This is really unusual. And it's so weird and so unusual that the Hittites, they send an ambassador over. They go to check it out. And they're like, what's up? The ambassador confirms, yeah, this is true. He goes back to the Hittites. They say, okay, we're going to send you a prince. And they send a prince. I'm a prince. I'm a prince. And the prince comes with, you know, a prince doesn't just go by himself. He's with an entourage. He's with a small task of an army, an entourage. He's going to marry. He's going to become the next pharaoh of Egypt. And he's met by Egyptians and killed. The whole party is killed off, assassinated. Dead, 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 dead. And so she never gets to marry this Hittite prince. And it seems that I, the vizier that was kind of helping out Tutankhamun, becomes the next pharaoh. Probably ended up marrying this girl and kind of forcing um, forcing the relationship. The weird thing is once once he's pharaoh, we, we they have his tomb, and she's not written about anymore. So, you know, they erase Tunagamin, they erase his sister, they start erasing the deeds of her father and his father, and the vizier I, he's really old at this point, he doesn't reign very long either, he starts reigning. And so what probably happened is Tuankhamun's murdered. You what? I believe there's a skull fracture in the back of his head. He's murdered. Uh, I stops his sister slash wife from taking over, from getting a prince from the Hittites, forces her to marry him. He becomes the new pharaoh. Then he does away with her, gets his wife back, his regular wife back, you know, sets up his temple or his tomb, and he'll rule on for the next couple of years because he's so old, he doesn't last very long. And after that, all of them get erased. Two uncommons erased, his sister's erased, his father's erased, I is erased. Um, that whole tainted, monotheistic, ah and stuff, anyone that has to do with that, gone. They're erased from the history books, just like Hatshepsut, they're also erased. And part of the problem, I shouldn't say part of the problem, part of the reason why uh, Tuankhamun's tomb wasn't dug up in the Valley of the Kings is that it, he wasn't on the records. Nobody knew who he was. He was not in the records of the line of kings. He's not there. And when they start digging him up and they're, they're finding pieces and hints that there was indeed a pharaoh named Tuankhamun in the Valley of the Kings, people are a bit puzzled by this. They're like, okay, but he's not on the records. Who is this guy? Does he actually have a tomb here? And that is how his tomb went so long without being robbed. Um, and, you know, if you had to ask Cleopatra who Tutankhamun was, she would not have known. She would have said, who? What? What are you talking about? That's how much he was erased. So, oddly enough, the most famous pharaoh to us today... Uh, Cleopatra would have no idea who he was. No idea. And another evidence, or another piece of evidence that shows that his death was unexpected and brief is this tomb itself. The tombs in Valley of the Kings go on and on and on and down and down and down. They're long and they're big and they have chambers. This tomb is like two rooms. It's like barely done. The antechamber where they shoved all his furniture in is just that. It's shoved in there. It is like they just had to quickly finish. You, you get two rooms. All your stuff for the next life are just going to be shoved in here. Uh, you know, it's not orderly. It's not well placed. It's kind of just stacked in. And that's it. 
we got to seal you up. His death mask was for another pharaoh. I, I believe there's a cartouche on the back of it that was for another pharaoh. It gets scribbled out to get two uncommons name in it. It wasn't even for him. So, completely unexpected. Probably murdered by I, who, you know, after the death of Akhenaten, kind of sees Egypt in turmoil, kind of sees what Akhenaten has done and left behind, and takes advantage of his kids and the family to become the next pharaoh. That's probably what happened. So, anyways, check out Bob Breer. He explains it way better. Um, excellent theory. So, with all that said, what do we know about Tuan Common? Well, that's it. We just don't know a lot. Died young, uh, has an injury to his skull, um, you know, has tons of stuff, but has a really small temple or tomb. Really small tomb. Um, didn't do much for Egypt. That's not his fault, but didn't do much for Egypt. Wasn't a great pharaoh. So I'm going to rank to Ankh Amun. I'd probably give him an F rank. Um, because how insignificant he is, but I kind of feel bad, <laughs> you know, he was murdered, not his fault, and on top of that, you know, he did leave us, um, you know, not purposefully, but accidentally, he did leave us with a tomb full of awesome things that we can learn so much from, or we have learned so much from. Um, so there's that. I'm a prince. So where to rank two on common? Probably world's greatest death mask. Um, even though it wasn't for him. So I wanted to put him at E. In terms of being a pharaoh. Now, being a person with the best tomb ever, definitely an S rank. But as a pharaoh, I'm going to give him an E. E because I feel bad he was murdered. Otherwise he'd be an F too. All right, so let's move to Ankh Amun over to E. Now, the next pharaoh is Tutmosis the Fourth. And there's not a lot known about him. He reigned nine to ten years. He was not supposed to be pharaoh. He's the son of Amenhotep. And he probably usurps his brother to become Pharaoh. And then he takes on the name of his grandfather, Tutmosis. His grandfather was Tutmosis III. He becomes Tutmosis IV. Named after Toth, so Toth is born, Tutmosis. And Tut Tutmosis III was a great military leader. Um, so it was a great name to reuse again, kind of remind the people, you're like your grandfather. And he's on this list because of the Dream Stella story. So what we do know about Tutmosis is that he finished his father's obelisk. That is the one that is the tallest in the world. So he has that finished. It's not finished by the time Amun Hoptep dies. He has that finished. It's erected. And eventually, it makes its way all the way back to Rome, and that is the one that is in the center of the Vatican City. So that one is the tallest in the world. So he has that finished. And the other thing we know is the Dream Stella. So what is the Dream Stella story? If you haven't already, go on your phone and get the app Dreaming of Space. Sphinx, Dreaming of Sphinx. It's free. It was done with uh, Harvard. And what it is, it's kind of like a 3D, they call it augmented reality. So it's an augmented reality of the Dream Stella. So you kind of scan your floor, and then the Dream Stella appears in front of you. And you can read it, if you read hieroglyphs. Um, or you can have the story told for you, so there's interactions, you can click on certain parts of the Stella, and you can see the story. Uh, what you can also do that's cool is you, then you can make the Sphinx appear uh, on your floor, and 
you can kind of get some sense of scale to the size of the Sphinx, the color of the Sphinx, so there's a timeline. You can see what color it was when it was first put up in the Old Kingdom to the, it was completely painted at one point and then to today's kind of weathered look. So get on there, check it out. It's called Dreaming Sphinx. It's an awesome app and it's going to give you far more detail of this story than I am. So I'm going to be, I'm going to give you the paraphrased version of the Dream Stella story. So what it is about is that Tutmosis the third or Tutmosis the fourth, he goes out to the Sphinx and he's out there and he falls asleep in the shade. Um, I'm guessing he must be sleeping under the head or something. Now at this point, the Sphinx is completely covered in sand. Remember that ancient Egypt is so long, the history is so long that they had their own archaeologists. You what? They had their own um, team of archaeologists to go out and, you know, try to figure out who built what, label things, put things back in order. And at this point, the Sphinx is buried in sand. Tusty! So during his dream, Tutmosis IV sees the Sphinx come to him in the dream. And the Sphinx tells him, if you uncover me, you will become the next pharaoh. Wow! So Tutmosis uh, uncovers the Sphinx, he gets it dug out, and he becomes the next pharaoh. Probably a propaganda story. What he probably did is probably usurped his brother, took control, became pharaoh, and then my guess is that he dug out the Sphinx as kind of a propaganda gesture to the people. He erected the stella there so that people would come and see and, you know, kind of connect him to being godlike. Oh, and, you know, the Sphinx also spoke to him, so it's destiny. They were really into that, um, being attached to gods, being attached to destiny. That really made the pharaoh uh, powers firm. Now, what we do know is that the dream Stella that is currently between the front paws of the Sphinx is not from the time of Tutmosis IV. The style of hieroglyphs in it is much later. So two things happen. Either one, the story is completely made up and was added, or two, it's kind of a replacement of the original Stella that was there that Tutmosis had erected. Um, who, who would erect that? Well, probably what they had around the Sphinx is a, a temple, the Sphinx Temple. And the priests in the monastery, I don't know, what, what would you call them? I guess they're priests. Uh, the priests there, you want people, it's kind of like a tourist thing, you want people to come. You want them to pay money, uh, you know, buy some trinkets, kind of see the Sphinx, uh, pay your dues, and, you know, kind of add this as an attraction hey, you know, this is not just a giant, beautiful statue. It also made someone a pharaoh. Go look at that Stella. Go read it. It's proof. But, you know, added much later, probably by the priests in the Sphinx Temple that's right nearby. Still there today. You can go visit it. And, yeah, that's the story of Tutmosis IV. So, don't know a lot about him. Reigned nine or ten years. Finished erecting his father's obelisk. So we get the tallest obelisk out of the world because he got it done. And we have that cool Dream Stella story, which may or may not have happened. Uh, whether or not he dug out the Sphinx and became king, or that's way later, and, you know. So let's take a look. Where am I gonna put Tutmosis IV and his Dream Stella? I think, uh, based on what we have left here, it's not a strong, not a strong case as a great pharaoh. I do like the story though. So we're gonna put him down at C. All right, go. Okay. So Tutmosis the fourth C. And if you haven't, go get that app, Dreaming of Sphinx. Check it out, it's really cool. And you can get more of the inside story of the Dream Stella. Oh, we need to check out his mummy before we forget. All right, let's see, what does Tutmosis IV look like now? 
All right, all right. Not bad. And what would Tutmosis the Fourth look like today? Let's reconstruct his face. Yikes. Okay. Well, there we go. To the next pharaoh. And our last pharaoh is Seti the First. So, what do we know about Seti? He has um, a great temple. Cool. And he also has a great tomb. He has the longest, deepest tomb at the Valley of the Kings. It is 446 meter, uh, sorry, 446 feet deep, 136 meters. His tomb has false caverns, false doors. It has fake burial chambers. Unfortunately, still robbed. So, bummer. Aww. And um, he has this great sarcophagus. His sarcophagus is still pretty well preserved. The bottom part, the lid, not so much. Bottom part is, it has great hieroglyphs still on it that tell us some good stories. And Seti the First was also a great mummy. <laughs> All right, so he could have one of the best well-preserved bodies in all of Egypt. His, uh, his mummy face kind of looks like he's sleeping. I mean, he looks like he's dead, but... DEAD? NO! It also looks like he's sleeping. All right, let's look at his mummy. So yeah, there you go. What do they say? Mummies don't crack. No wrinkles. You what? I don't know. All right. So, Seti the First, one of the best mummies. What would Seti the First look like today? Okay, not bad, not bad. All right. So, he was also a military leader, just like his father. He fought the Hittites. He began the Hippostyle Hall at Karnak Temple. That's the big famous room with the huge pillars. So he begins that. That's up to him. Um, what else? Well, that's all I got. Toasty! Oh. Um, his tomb at Valley of the Kings has some of the best preserved artwork on the walls. Some of the best. And on it are some of the great stories and... For example, when we learned about the mythology, mythology, mythical, the mythical story, waitress, the story from Egyptian mythology of Sekhmet, uh, Sekhmet wanted to come and kill all the humans because Ra uh, is upset at them and Sekhmet goes and the humans trick Sekhmet into drinking um, colored beer, red colored beer. Uh, and she thinks it's blood. She drinks and drinks and drinks, you know, gets drunk, passes out, becomes calmer, turns into the goddess Bastet. And that is all from his temple walls. It's all illustrated on there. So the preservation of his wall gives us a lot of stories to read to this day. And it gives us a lot of some of the great artwork I don't think this one is open. In fact, I'm pretty sure this one is not open to tourists. It goes pretty deep. It's really steep. It's generally unsafe, it looks like, from what I've seen of it. So, not open to tourists, but hey, maybe one day if you become an Egyptologist, you can check it out. Cool. Um, definitely check out pictures of it. Definitely check out some videos if you can. Uh, there are people out there who have been inside, they can describe what's on the wall, the stories, and the artwork, and it's fantastic. So, oh, another thing. One thing that makes Seti the First interesting, too, is that he takes his pharaoh name, his god name, after Set. That demon-headed, monster-headed god that tears Osiris apart. Um... He, you know, he's jealous of Osiris, he tears him apart, and Isis has to go and wrap them all back together, and you get your first mummy from that myth. Um, he, yeah, so he takes his name after Set. Very unusual, but uh, there you go.
another uh, another interesting thing about SETI. He's obviously the first one to do it because he's SETI the first. But he won't be the only one. Now, where are we going to rank SETI? His successor is Ramses the Great. But, you know, with having the largest, deepest tomb in Valley of the Kings, with having all that fantastic artwork, he's the first to essentially have artwork over every single passage in his tomb. And the sarcophagus, the temple that he has built or has finished building, there's a lot of mysteries to his temple. And, you know, his name is pretty cool. Why, why not? Kind of, you, you pick the, the bad guy name. I think Seti the first is, I would say he's a B. Let's put him in B. All right. So there is my ranking. Let me know what you think. Let me know how you would have ranked these particular pharaohs. Now, obviously, there's more pharaohs we could have used. There's some semi-pharaohs. You know, we had Alexander the Great as the leader of Egypt. We could have put him in here. There's way more. But I want to know what do you think. How would you have ranked these pharaohs? What would you have changed? What would you have done different? And finally, I would encourage you to go out. Now, I, obviously, I'm not an Egyptologist. <laughs> so go out. Uh, check out some lectures, get some lectures, uh, books on tape, lectures, videos. Uh, you can check out lots of uh, free videos of people just exploring Egypt, per people that are more professional in Egypt than I am. And, you know, fill in the details, fill in the gaps, answer those questions you might have after watching this. There's still so much to learn about Egypt. So let me know, what do you think? How would you have ranked these nine, nine, nine pharaohs? What would you have done differently? Thanks for watching. Bye bye.